the splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice oh, all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and oh see how great how great is our God age to age he stands and time is in his hand Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Oh, name above all names, you are worthy of all praise. Now my heart sing how great is our God. Name above all names, you are worthy of all praise. Now my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Lord God, you are good. I pray that we will remember your goodness. Lord, I pray that this evening as we dive into your word, uh, you would just soften our hearts so that we would be teachable, so that we would remember what your word says. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears that would be in tune with you this evening. Not just this evening, but every day of the week. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be patient and quiet while we're listening to you. Lord, we love you. Have your way with us this evening. While we do His good will, 
he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey and then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet we will walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. For knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater You're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Oh, all I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world reveals, and was to own all I want thought gain I have counted loss spent and worthless now compared to this knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater You're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you, and known as yours, to possess. could not earn all surpassing gift of righteousness knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings to become like you in your death my lord so with you to live and never die greater 
my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you did on that cross. Lord, as we draw near to you, I know in your word it says you draw near to us. Lord Jesus, I, I pray that you'd speak to each heart this evening. We thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have plenty of time to pray, so let's spend some time praying. I know there are plenty of prayer requests. Um, you're welcome to get into some groups and pray for one another, but let's spend some time uh, seeking the Lord.
to share with the group. Yes, Margie. Your whole house? Are you in it? Your house. All right. We're going to pray over, over the, the, the house of Minix. Okay. We can do that. Uh, let's see. Right now, we have a, a Louise Abernathy with COVID. Um, I spoke to her uh, again on the way here this evening. Um, she's having a pretty rough time. Yes, she is. And then uh, both Jean and Heather have COVID. Um, Heather's in Galveston, and I'm not sure exactly what her symptom level is, but I don't think it's that bad. I, I, uh, when I say I visited with Jean today, I didn't get close to Jean today. We were just in the same yard. But uh, he's having a pretty rough time as well. Also, Marta Brain, who was here at VBS with her son Caleb. Caleb was baptized on Friday night. She also has COVID. So let's uh, be diligent in our, our, our COVID prayers. We want to be praying for Mandy Stillwell's family. Mandy's father passed away last night. Anybody else? Oh, oh for uh, uh, Mr. Perry? Yeah, Perry Christie. Uh, okay, I, I hadn't heard that yet. Um, and then pray for uh, me. I leave in the morning, uh, headed to Matagorda. Pray for the Matagorda event. We're, we're full and... There be, um, be a bunch of salvations and baptisms is what I'm hoping for, but whatever, as long as no one dies of heat stroke, we'll be all, all right. And then actually when I get back, I'm basically one day, and then I, I got, I'm off to Hawaii. So for the next two Wednesdays, Luke will be leading the service, and for the next three Sundays, John Mays will be preaching. We'll be praying for them as well, and the tax that will come against their families. Uh, when the, whenever you accept the invitation to preach, You've also accepted an invitation for an attack against your family. It happens every single time. So, Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the opportunity to prayer that we can pray over the Minix household and pray for both the physical and everybody in there, and you know exactly what we're praying for. Uh, so we join our hearts together and lift up our brothers and sister, uh, Margie and Phil, in, 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 in their home and ask that you just protect it and bless it and restore it. Uh, Father, I pray that they get in that kitchen perfectly. Father, we also want to lift up those that we've mentioned with COVID um, and others who we might not be aware of, but Father, we can continue to deal with uh, this virus as it ma makes its appearance from time to time. Um, we pray for comfort and healing for those who, who have it right now. Uh, Father, we also uh, want to pray for Margie and, and the whole Stillwell family. Lord, we ask that you be with them as they go through this time of mourning. I'm praying particularly for, for Mandy and her mother. Um, give her mother, uh, Lord, just an extra, an extra dose of grace in, 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 in your love. Father, we'd ask, uh, as we always do when we pray, for revival in our nation, for common sense to prevail. Um, Father, I pray against the silliness in the lies that are not only being accepted, but being repeated and, and taught as fact. Um, it's just mind-blowing mind to me. Father, let the revival start here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, stunned. The condition of our world is stunning. I just heard the governor of Michigan being interviewed um, over what she could do as governor to protect uh, abortion rights should Roe v. Wade be overturned. And in her speech, she would not use the word woman. She described these people as menstruating people, twice. The governor, folks, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. All right, so here we go. We're going to finish the book of Ecclesiastes tonight. So uh, after, I don't know how many months we've been in this, but here we are, we've made it to the end. So I'm going to begin at the seventh verse of the 11th chapter, and we'll go all the way through the end of the 12th chapter. So I'll read it all at once. And then we'll start getting into it. So uh, verse 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 from the ESV version of the Bible. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. 
Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and as years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dim and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low, they are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge and weighing and studying and arranging many prof uh, proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected saying. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay, so you ever build a balsa wood bridge? When I was in junior high school, eight, um, I want to say eighth grade, eighth or ninth grade, uh, we did a project and, and it was building a, a bridge. And after the bridges all were built, uh, we were in groups, so there was more than one of us working on it. There'd be this contest to see which one of the balsa wood bridges would hold the most weight. And some of the bridges, you know, them kids, I know they went on to be engineers. They were elaborate and, er, and beautiful and all kinds of material. My, mine, well, more rustic. Uh, I wasn't into bridge building or school much, really, as what I wasn't into. Um, and then they started the contest. And they were actually using uh, water in a, in a container as, as the putting on the bridge. And you know what? Every single bridge broke eventually. Everyone broke. They all broke. And in life, ultimately, everything breaks. So what this means and what Solomon is trying to tell us in this, in this passage we just read is that if our identity, if, if our hope, if our confidence is in how we compare against others uh, at some point in their lives, well, then ultimately, we're ultimately building our foundation on, on sinking sand. And even though you, you might be a little bit behind someone here, or you might be a little ahead of someone there, the point is that ultimately, a, even every bridge you build won't stand up. Eventually, everything is going to break. You need a firmer foundation, one that's not built on shifting thinking sand. They ought to do a song. Wait, no, they already did. So Ho Solomon says, as he ends this book of wisdom, is that you need to build your life on the rock-solid foundation of God himself. In Jesus Christ and him crucified, you need to do this through all the days of your life, from when you were young to when you're old, for as many years as the Lord gives you and trusts you until he calls you home. And af afterwards, as Solomon reminds us, because after that comes the judgment. The Bible says that his appointed man wants to die and then the judgment. So the, the overwhelming or the overarching thought here is, is, is kind of fear God and keep his commandments. For that is the whole duty of man. Right out of Ecclesiastes 12 ver verse 13. So tonight, three parts to the teaching as we, we, we look at. First, it's, it's when you're young. And the second is when you're older. And the third is forever. So kind of fear God in those those categories. So number one, fear God in your youth. Look at verse 7 again, uh, chapter 11. 
light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So Solomon is starting a comparison here, a comparison here, but it's not really clear yet where he's going with this. So we have to peek ahead a little bit uh, in the passage to see where he's going. And he's talking about, uh, about light, and light is sweet. And he's talking about eyes that see, especially that see the light of the sun. And that is an image in the Bible of you in the earlier years of our, our lives. We're, and you're going to see that Solomon later talks about dim dyes and, and darkness of old age. In fact, one of the main ways the Bible talks about old age is dim dye. For example, Isaac in Genesis 27, verse 1. His old, and the Bible says, and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. Jacob, Genesis 48, verse 1. Again, old and his eyes were dim so he could not see. Eli, the priest under whom Samuel served. Uh, again, he was only reading Samuel uh, 3, 2. He was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. Dimmed eyes are a product of old age. So Solomon is saying, enjoy light while you can, well, you can see it. It's sweet. It's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Verse 8. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. And what he's saying here is pretty simple. It's like life, life is precious and life is sacred. And every moment of your life from the beginning to the end is something that you should enjoy and you should savor because he says the days of darkness will be many. Now, what are those, the days of darkness? Well, there's a couple thoughts here. One is that the days of darkness could refer, refer to old age. If old age is characterized by dimness of sight, then, then old age could be the darkness that he's referring to here. Or this dimness, this darkness, it could also refer to death. Or this, uh, d death is the final envelopment of darkness around us and, and it's often been talked about that way in the bible or it may not refer to the lifespan of a, of a human being it may be talking about the lifespan of the world itself the end of the world might be in, be in view here the the great day of the lord the final day of god when god brings all of history to an end and brings everyone in judgment uh, which you would see in, in, in amos chapter 5 verse 20 they, he describes that day as a day of darkness it's not the day of the lord darkness is what he says, and not light and gloom with no brightness in it. So Solomon, whatever the view is, Solomon's saying, enjoy the years when there's light and enjoy all the years of your life. But remember, the days of darkness will be many. Whether he's talking about your age or the end of your life or the end of the world, it's still true. There's a warning there, not to give too much attention just to your youth. Verse 9, encouragement to enjoy youth. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer in the days of your youth. Enjoy this youth. But he says, be mindful of the coming judgment. So have a great time, but don't forget. He says, walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know for that all these things God will bring you into judgment. Now that's interesting if you've read the rest of the Bible about this walk in the ways of your heart. And, and, and the sight of your eyes is how often we're told elsewhere in the Bible not to walk. We're told not to walk in the ways of our heart and not to walk after our own, our, our own sight. Uh, lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge him and he shall make your... We're warned over and over to don't rely on ourselves. Uh, it, first, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. So well, it sounds like the opposite. But Solomon isn't contradicting those verses. He, he, he's not contradicting the many places where we're told not to follow the ways of our hearts. What he's saying here is not a contradiction because this passage talks about morality, or those passages talk about morality. Will you trust in your own wisdom or will you trust in, in your own insight? Will you trust in what you can see or will you trust in the Lord? That's the other verses. Here, Solomon's simply saying, Enjoy this life while you, can, while you can see it and savor it. The warning says don't go too far off uh, in everything that you do because God will eventually bring you into judgment. So they're not, it's not contradictory. And then in verse 10, he really encourages us to enjoy our youth. Uh, remove vexation from your heart. Put away pain from your body. For youth and the dawn of life are vanity. They're myths. They're here and then you're 60. 
right? Your 67. You look up and it's like, what, what, what happened? So enjoy this while it's here. Youth ends far too soon. I, I'm not what I would consider to be old, but some might disagree. Uh, I'm probably not quite in the young category anymore. Uh, today, I'm, right now I'm enjoying the last year of my 50s, which means that I am still 16 years shy of the average life expectancy of an American male, which is 76 years. I haven't had that, that many years on earth yet, but it's astonishing how much has changed even in my short lifetime. I love those posts on Facebook where like, name something kids won't know about. Like, I, rotary phone. Have you ever seen the video when they put a rotary phone in front of a kid? It's hilarious. Or, or eight tracks. Uh, re record player, what, what else? Anybody think of anything else? What are those things we used to have? I saw one that I thought was great. It was with the old uh, metal ice cube trays. You know, with the with the tray and then the right and it was like what are these two pieces said, there's like no there's no idea all of that has passed away just in my lifetime that's the picture a little bit of what happens in our youth we have these vivid memories when, when, when life is sweet and pleasant for the eyes to see the sun and, and as Solomon says enjoy, enjoy all this while you can children enjoy your childhood you're never going to get it back again i wish i had that information and understood it when i was younger young people enjoy the stage where you are because you never get it back again and those of you with the new babies enjoy that state it doesn't come back nothing can withstand the test of time it all eventually breaks down Youth is but one season under heaven. There's a time to be born. But as Solomon is about to remind us, there's also a time to die. So Solomon exhorts us to take seriously old age and death. So that's the first portion of the scripture tonight. Fearing God when you're young. Now we get to when you're old. Uh, verse 1 through, uh, through verse 8 of chapter 12 is where we are. Uh, the final word of the main part of this book. Uh, this main section, and I'm going to show you how, how we find the, the end of that in, in a little bit. But this is the last part of the book, and then he gets to his epilogue at the end. His, his main point is fear God in old age. The second section, fear God, and, and it starts in verse 1, verse, chapter 12. This one transitions from the previous section to this one. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw, near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Now we read in verse 9, of chapter 11 that we should remember our creator because judgment is coming but here solomon is telling us that we should remember our creator in the days of our youth because of joy one of the commentators on on this guy named charles bridge wrote uh, wrote this line and it really stood out to me many have remembered their creator too late in life but none too soon not that well there's a reason why he's a published author yeah. so i look back at my life and I don't regret a single thing I gave up following Jesus. I want to say that again because somebody on video might be watching that. I look back at my life and I do not regret a single thing I gave up to follow Jesus. I don't regret any of the parties I've missed. I don't regret any of the lifestyle and the people around me uh, that, that they were living back then. I don't regret stepping away from all that. I don't regret missing out on any of it. My only regret is that I didn't start following Jesus as closely as I could, as early as I could. That's what I regret. My only regret. Many people find their creator too late, but nobody finds him too soon. You see, when you're young, you tend to think that you're invincible. At least I did. And Solomon, Solomon reminds us here that young invincibility very quickly fades away, way quicker than we realize. The days are coming when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Then verse 2 through 7, he turns to the, this extended metaphor of this sort of stream of uh, images that sort of roll by us. Now, sometimes he's building an extended metaphor where he details, uh, his details are very clear, you know, pretty much exactly what he's talking about. 
And other times, some people have tried to sort of press the details too far to say, well, this refers to that, and this refers to that, and, and there, it, it's a little too hard to make some of those connections for me. Where the details are not always clear, the general meaning always is. And he's giving us a tremendous range of imagery to remind us about what old age does to all of us. So look at what he says in verse 2. Here, here's where he brings back that, that comparison that he started in verse 7 of chapter 11 uh, with, with, with you characterized as being, uh, seeing the sweet light, whereas old age is characterized by darkness. Chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. Now, we're not just talking about clouds that come back to bring a healthy life-giving rain. Now, these are clouds that come after the rain is over and they just hang out and darken the sky. Then there's verse 3. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dim. So metaphor after metaphor after metaphor. And we have here at the beginning of a description of the house really that, that's falling apart with age. And it begins with the keepers of the house probably talking about limbs and arms and legs that tremble. And, and, and then the keeper of the house trembles and the strong men are bent. And what used to be strong, uh, a strong back is now bent over with age. The grinders cease because they're few, probably referring to your teeth. The old age makes it difficult to chew. Those who look through the windows are dimmed again. We're having that, that sight imagery again. Someone looking out of his house and can't quite see through the windows anymore. And then verse 4 begins this, this discussion of hearing uh, uh, and the doors of the streets are shut. And the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low. One rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. So when we shut the doors, we can't hear what's going on outside. And that's what happens to this house. And, and, and where the youth think that they are invincible, those who are old know fear. They are afraid, it says next verse. They are afraid also of what is high. And terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms. The grasshopper drags itself along. And desire fails because man is going to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the street. And then verse 5, the, the almond tree blossoms. Well, that's like promising new life blossoms. But it's giving you an image. If you think of an almond tree, when it blossoms, it has like white, whitened hair on, on, on top. So the grasshopper drags itself along. Think about how spry and nimble grasshoppers usually are. But now we got one that's just dragging itself along as the, the days creep on year after year in, 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 in uh, you know, fall toward colder season, you even see these gra grasshoppers that can barely move anymore the colder it gets. And the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and all of a sudden the house is no longer decaying. We find ourselves in the middle of a funeral and the mourners are in the street and the end has come. That was verse 5. That was like all that in one verse. In verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. So don't try to press the details of what the cord is and what the bowl is and what the pitcher is and what the wheel is, because I've heard preachers just have a heyday with this stuff, and you can do that because there's really no more direction than this, and there's no way to from someone to say, well, it doesn't mean that, because you can make those things represent in anything if you want. This is an image, what it is. Like I said, when the details aren't there, the general meaning is. So this is an image of the, the fragility of life. In just a moment, it's gone. And, and then in verse 7, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. When God first created Adam, he gathered together dust, and he molded it and shaped that dust into Adam's body. And then God himself stooped down and breathed the breath of life into this man, Theonusto. And when sin entered the world and, and man rebelled against God, God told him that you are dust to dust and you shall return. Our bodies return to the dust and the life breath that's been on loan is returned to God. We are returned back to dust and the Spirit returns back to him who gave it. And in verse 8, the preacher ends this main section of Ecclesiastes with, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Now we know 
that this is the end of the main section because this is the tale where, where there's a corresponding top at the very beginning of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 1, verse 2, it's the same thing. We've got bookends here. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 12, whatever verse that was, nine, uh, verse 8. So now we, we've, we've got it. We've done the whole portion of, of the book. Uh, he began on that word, and now he ends on that word. Everything is a mist. It's a breath. It's a vapor. It's here. It's gone. And everything, even when you're young, one day you're going to grow old, and you're going to break down, and you're going to die. Everything breaks down and dies. All, all is vanity. Most of you know that I'm a football fan. What team? Seahawks, yeah, that's right. I just like hearing the word. Uh, one of the bittersweet moments for me every year is when they induct, no, we never lose. No, it's when they induct new Hall of Fame players into the Hall of Fame of football. Because all the living Hall of Famers are there. And the camera scans through the audience guys that I used to watch as a, a, a kid that, that, you know, could run faster than anyone else and hit harder than anyone else are with a walker and a cane. Heroes of my youth. And now they're old. I love seeing it because it's kind of bittersweet. Even more cruel, perhaps, is like when you see the reunion shows of sitcoms. I kind of actually enjoy this. Uh, especially the sitcoms that glamorize and, uh, idealize and idolize youth and then you see the the reunion of them 20 years later and look how much they've aged <laughs> and, and and all the, the the beauty and the good looks and all that, that that they had going for them back back then it is all faded away 20 years later isn't dead in 20 years and been so kind if they were living for their youth if that was everything there was to them if that's what the show was about and their lives had already peaked when they were in their 20s. How tragic is that? How, how, how tragic to live clinging to what cannot be retained. If youth is everything, what do you do when it's gone? Youth is a, a time of light, and it is, it, it's a time of joy, but it's also fleeting. Old age is a time of darkness and fragility. No one likes old age better than being young. And Solomon acknowledges that there are years you're going to say, I have no pleasure in me. And, this, and those of us who are older, you know those days when it, when it hurts to get out of bed and you don't know why. My, uh, the question I hate is, why are you limping? And I don't have an answer. Yeah, I mean, that's because I got legs. I didn't, there was no accident, didn't fall, didn't twist anything. It just hurt. You know? You'll have pleasure in it, but, but not the kind that you had when you were young. In your youth. And then, death comes to us all. And Solomon wants us to know life under the sun is so fragile, it is so fickle, it is so fleeting to cling to, it's futile and foolish to try to do so. Wisdom insists then that we have to remember our creator because he and he alone is the eternal one who stands outside of time. Time does not age God. God is not any older today than he was 2,000 years ago. He is outside of time. God does not age. He is the ageless one, the Bible calls him. He's neither older nor younger. He's never been before. He's always before. He is and he always will be. Jesus Christ is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord. I do not change. There is no before and, and after with God. Listen, this is the most theologically sound statement you'll ever hear. It's three words. God simply is. When we're young, when we're old, and we'll end it here on and forever. Solomon concludes all this book in verse 9 through 14. 
and it's an exhortation to remember his creator. And, and then we come to this, this section three in view of eternity. Some of the commentators call this the epilogue or conclusion. But the point is that this stands outside of the, the, the rest of the book that was bookend by Vanity Vanities. He's surveyed everything. And now he comes to his final conclusion. What should we take from all this? And this is the application, if you will, section of the sermon. So in verse 9 through 10, uh, part of this is tracing the preacher's work in life and in ministry. Besides being wise, Solomon also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and upright. You notice that the person that this is written in has changed now. Now he's writing in the first person, the preacher. Uh, the preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. We're actually told in 1 Kings uh, chapter 4, verse 32, that Solomon spoke, not wrote, spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. We well, you know we're pretty good today at accessing information. We want to be able to Google something. I read something the other day that my mom slapped me so hard, uh, Google couldn't find me. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's like, she must know my mom. But, uh, we want to be able to Google something at the drop of a hat and, and figure out an answer to anything and look it up on Wikipedia or whatever, figure that kind of thing out. The ancients, they had a very different perspective. They val valued not mere access just to know that I can look it up, and, and they didn't value mere information. They wanted mastery of wisdom. For someone to memorize 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs is an extraordinary feat of wisdom. And he mastered this great wisdom over the course of his life, and he tried to pass it on. He was a teacher, and he tried to find words of delight, and uprightly, it says, he wrote words of truth. Then in verse 11 and 12, he talks about what these words did. He says, quote, The words of the wise are like gold. And like nails, firmly fixed, are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd, capitalized. My son, beware of anything beyond those, or these, or of, of making many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. So goats, they prod livestock. That's what a goat does. So if you're trying to get a cow or a sheep to, to go in a certain direction, a goat with a big stick that you poke them to go in that direction that, that, that you want them to go. We need these in our lives to be goaded by these words of wisdom, that it moves us in the direction that he wants us to go. And then he says the words of wisdom are also like nails. Now, you think of what nails do. They fix something down, particularly for a shepherd, that's what's in view here. The shepherd who's goading, the shepherd who has nails firmly fixed down, the one shepherd from whom on wisdom comes, this is a shepherding imagery here. The shepherd would have used these nails to fix down his tent from sight to sight. Wisdom teaches us to know when we need to move and when we need to remain steadfast and fixed and steady. And what Solomon warns us is that too much information, too many books, can obscure the clarity of God's wisdom. The wisdom that comes from one shepherd. Of course, this one shepherd is God. That's why it's capitalized in the translation. Because Psalm 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my and when Jesus Christ came into the world, he declared, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, verse 11. That's where wisdom comes from. And it comes from the timeless one, the eternal one, the one who's not affected by time because he created time and encompasses it all before him in his eternal wisdom and power. And then verse 13. He says, the end of the matter. All has been heard. I've done it all. Got the t-shirt. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He has surveyed everything under the sun. And what does he say? Wisest man, richest man. Well, here's what he says. Fear God and keep his commandments. After considering everything in this world, he says there's nothing in here that's going to satisfy you like, uh, like what you're looking for. Instead of looking under the sun, look above it. Look to the creator of the sun. Fear God and keep his commandments. We've talked before about what fear God means. It means on, on the one hand, acknowledge your vulnerability and your helplessness and your hopelessness and your guilt because of sin. 
and be truthful about it, not to try to hide it, not to try to make justifications or excuses, is to acknowledge them before the judge of all the earth. You stand guilty. It's to go to that same judge. Fear the Lord. It's to go to that same judge and recognize that he's your only hope because he's loved you so much that he has sent his son, Jesus, into the world to die for your sin, and to die in your place for your sin so that you might be reconciled to him by grace through faith. It's to trust in the same Lord because of his promises anyway, even though you are guilty. The fear of God, the fear of the Lord, is another word, then for faith. And the Bible everywhere declares that we are justified, we are made righteous before God by faith. We are counted as righteous before him by faith. So Solomon says, fear God, and then he adds this line. He says, keep the commandments. Don't miss this. No, I'm almost done. That's not to atone for your sin or your guilt. Keeping the commandments is not a way for you to appease God. This isn't to earn something before God. You are saved by grace through faith alone and not by works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I've just preached on it. And then verse 10 for VBS. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not by works so anyone can boast. So we're not saved by keeping the commandments. Rather, when the Bible talks about keeping the commandments, it's, it's, it's always as a loving response or, or gratitude. You keep the commandments because you are saved knowing that Jesus did pay the price for a sin that you were guilty of. That's why you keep the commandment. To keep the commandment is another word for what the Bible calls sanctification. Grow, growing in, in holiness, being conformed into the image of God, uh, which, which no one would... Well, we are justified by faith, by the fear of God, and we are sanctified by God's power. It's by God's grace, through faith, we seek to keep his commandments. So in verse 14, last verse, he closes with this word, these words. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So a life lived for the fleeting pleasures of this world is its own reward in full, and those pleasures so quickly fading away. Nothing lasts. Everything ultimately breaks down. A life lived for the glory of God, who is not under the sun. He is above the sun. He's the one who created us. And the life lived for his glory, that life, it will not be in vain. Amen? And thus ends the book of Ecclesiastes. Father, thank you for the many months you've given us to study your word, uh, the ancient word written by him who you called the wisest and the richest. Father, I pray that we all learn something about prioritizing our lives, how to live, as we titled this series, in a broken world. We pray that in Jesus' name and all those gathered said, Amen.